If you, as a consumer, want to do the right thing with your e-waste garbage, you won't throw it in the dumpster. You'll take it to a recycler, right? This is what the local government will tell you to do. This is what the state government will tell you to do. This is what the federal government will tell you to do. But what they don't tell you is by taking it to a recycler, that piece of e-waste has a very high probability of being exported by a ship to China or other Asian destination. Nobody had ever bothered to go look and see what that recycling in Asia really looked like. BAN, a global watchdog group dedicated to preventing toxic trades of all kinds, decided to conduct a field investigation. Following up news articles and emails from mainland China, BAN was directed to an e-waste processing area known as Guayu on the Longdong River near the city of Shantou in the northeast Guangdong province, four hours by car from Hong Kong. In the course of three intensive days in and around Guayu's four villages, the small investigative team witnessed firsthand what passes for recycling of e-waste in Asia. By this investigation, they were for the first time able to provide the Western world with more than just a guess of what the underbelly of our consumptive cyber age lifestyle really looks like. Six years ago, Guayu was a peaceful rice growing village. But life in Guayu changed dramatically when it began receiving its first truckloads of imported e waste. Guayu has now been transformed into a bustling, sprawling junkyard for much of the world's electronic discards. Lured by the possibility of making a dollar fifty for a day's work, Residents of rural farming provinces migrate to Guayu to toil long hours breaking e-waste down to the component materials of steel, aluminum, copper, plastic and gold. The operations are primitive, labor-intensive and of a small scale. However, taken as a whole, the sheer number of the individual operations in the Guayu area is impressive and significant. It is estimated that 100,000 people make their living scrapping e-waste here. However, with the newly found wealth have come severe environmental costs. Since only part of the waste stream can truly be recycled, and due to the hazardous nature of the waste itself, and the hazardous processes employed in recycling it, the pollution in and around the town has become obvious and ugly. Sixty-year-old Mr. Ling summed up the town's transformation this way to a Chinese journalist. For money, people have made a mess of this good farming village. After they have dismantled the computers, they burn the useless parts. Every day, villagers inhale this dirty air. Their bodies have become weak. Many people have developed respiratory and skin problems. Some people wash vegetables and dishes with the polluted water, and they get stomach sickness. Open dumping of the unrecyclable plastics, processing residues, burned and discarded circuit boards, leaded CRT glass, toner cartridges, and other debris is commonplace. For the last five years, well water and surface water in Guayu has been undrinkable and has to be trucked in from a town 30 kilometers away. Water tanks hauled by tractors are a constant sight on the streets of Guayu. Plastic computer wastes of various kinds are collected and sent on to another of the Guayu villages that specializes in separating, chipping, and then melting plastics into large extruded pieces for low-quality plastics applications elsewhere. Scientists confirm that melting plastics is likely to create dioxins and furons when PVC plastic is involved. Likewise, e-wastes impregnated or coated with flame retardants may create dioxins. This is a very serious problem, as use of these highly polluting flame retardants in electronic plastics is widespread. It was estimated that about half of the imported e-waste plastic is not recycled, but is either burned or dumped in the vicinity of Guayu. Perhaps the most profitable and most dangerous recycling operation involves the processing of electronic printed circuit boards. After the circuit boards are pulled from the computers, they are then handled by one of the hundreds of desoldering laborers operating all over town. The circuit boards are placed over a coal-fired grill until the solder melts. Then the chips are plucked from the boards for later sorting. Some of the workers use fans to blow the fumes away, but inhalation of the lead tin solder vapors is inevitable, as is the ambient fallout of the heavy metals over the entire community. After the valuable chips are removed, the boards are often burned to recover residual solder and discarded in the environment. Here along the river, even after a government cleanup operation, 
Massive piles of charred circuit boards lie dumped, reduced to ashen fiberglass skeletons. Analysis of the river water, soil, and sediment samples here revealed alarming levels of heavy metals. Soil here had levels of lead more than 200 times the level at which the Dutch government considers sediment to be a hazardous waste. River water here was found to be 2,400 times the World Health Organization's threshold level for lead in drinking water. In 2002, BAN, the Basel Action Network, uncovered a dirty little secret of the high-tech industry. BAN's documentary film, Exporting Harm, revealed that electronic waste, such as scrap computers, is in fact hazardous waste, and that as much as 80% of the growing mountains of hazardous e-waste collected for recycling in wealthy, developed countries is instead exported to Asia. Through the convenience of a global e-waste trade, the electronics industry has been able to avoid responsibility for the impacts of their toxic products and has instead been able to pass these hazards and their costs off to some of the world's poorest communities and workers in destinations like China or India. And now, three years after uncovering the high-tech trashing of Asia, BAN's investigative team crosses a shaky bridge over the digital divide to witness increasing amounts of electronic wastes arriving in Africa. Much of what is being exported to them is not functional or reusable, or very quickly becomes obsolete, leaving a rapidly growing legacy of toxic waste that burdens the poorest communities, lacking any infrastructure to deal with it. The second largest city in the world, and Africa's most populous city, Lagos, Nigeria, is experienced as overwhelming, overgrown, and overburdened, but a dynamic hotbed of entrepreneurial spirit in a country rapidly becoming hardwired to the information age. No place better exemplifies the latest global trends in the e-waste trade than the massive computer and electronics markets found in Lagos. And nowhere is the love affair with electronic goods, both new and used, more apparent than in the Icasia computer village. A vast majority of the computer village's business deals with used equipment, mostly imported from Europe and North America. If you open up the container, since they bought it non-tested from overseas, you are trying your luck. Before leaving the computer village, Ban went back to the Computer Dealers Association office to ask the beneficiaries of the burgeoning second-hand electronics trade just how serious was this problem of imported, obsolete, junk electronics. I will tell you that we have a greater percentage of those that cannot be used than those that can be used. Uh, honestly speaking, I would say 75% of these items are not usable. The control is supposed to be from the international community where these things are coming from. If they know they, they, who has the facility to control these joints, allow this thing to come to Africa country that have no facilities, then this is all uh, wickedness. If the third world countries have been allowed as a dumping ground for items that are full of toxicity, then we are not helping the world. It is, it is to me, Inhumanity to man. The investigative team asked Mr. Oboro where the dealers obtained the imported used equipment. He directed them to large wholesale warehouses and yards near the port where the containers first arrive after clearing customs. There are still a lot of junks. How can they? There are a lot of junks in Lagos, and uh, uh, if nobody buys them, they get thrown away. At the warehouses, the fate of much of the unmarketable imports was revealed. This equipment is seen as worthless even here in Lagos, and without recycling destinations, piles up in cavernous warehouses gathering dust. And just outside the gates, dumpsters were found laden with rejected e-waste scrap. Definitely I want the country where these goods are coming from to at least give the, us, the developing nation, working items. We should not be classed as a dumping nation where you just bring anything that is not good, you just come and throw them here in Nigeria. No. I want them to give us things that is working, things that they will use in their, in their own country. should be what they should export to other countries. Just treat us like one of them. I employ the government of, that, of each of these countries where they export from 
to kindly monitor the items and let us as well be happy. The dumpsters located inside the computer village and in many other open markets began to provide a clue. These trash bins are filled each day and trucked to local dumps. But a closer look at just a few dumps found outside the markets exposed the horrible face of uncontrolled e-waste importation and management in Nigeria. Outside, just on the outskirts of the Laba Market, the electronics market here in Lagos, Nigeria. This material is being picked over by scavengers to get the last bit of value from the material. Metals, copper, the wires will be burnt to extract the copper. This whole pile here, is, they tell us, is going to be burnt very soon to reduce the volume of it. It's routine that this happens. They'll light it on fire and it'll burn down into the swamp here. Uh, we see computers, carcasses here. We see television carcasses from all over the world, from Germany, from USA, from Japan. And this is their final resting place here in Lagos, Nigeria.